Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and we are so excited. We have, our guest has the website mydailyleadership.com. And Antonio, how do you pronounce your last name? Garrido? <laughs> is it Garrido? Well, Garrido, but if you Garrido. want to do full, the full accent, it'd be Garrido, but Garrido. Oh, Garrido. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Antonio will be fine. <laughs> Antonio is with us, and we are talking about how to unlock the elite leader within. And we're talking about what got you here won't get you there. And we're talking about daily tactics to increase your leadership skills. And one of the things I love that he's going to talk about is that wisdom comes from evaluated experience. So we need to kind of look back and see what did we do there? What do we need to change? What do we need to improve? So Antonio, welcome. Hi, Shant. Thank you very much. I do appreciate the invitation. I am uh, a big fan of the show. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Well, let's talk about that for just a second, because I think that right now, more than ever, that slogan, what got you here won't get you there, is like paramount, right? Because no matter what business you're in, you've got to make a few changes to kind of compete with all of the things that are in your way. So what what are some things that someone needs to look at when you say, what got you here won't get you there? How do you evaluate <laughs> that of what you need to change and how you need to pivot? Well, okay, so that's a big question. I'll try and be, I'll try and be succinct as possible with the answer. Here's the thing. In, t- in terms of the principle of what got you here won't necessarily get you there. The, the fact is that the environment and not only because of technology and so on, but also consolidation in the marketplace, also, you know, COVID, the economy, I, it's, it's always bonkers fluid, right? Bonkers dynamic and always, always changing. Well, leaders have to, it's their job, right? So if you ask a hundred leaders, what is your job? What's your responsibility? And people are going to say, oh, you know, to maximize shareholder value. And the usual pat kind of, you know, leadership answers to what their job is. What their job is, is to guarantee the future success or the, the future success of themselves and therefore by default their people and therefore by default their business and their customers into the future. Well, what does the future look like? Well, who knows, right? None of us have a crystal ball, but it's the leader's responsibility, not only to describe the vision and mission and, you know, the core values of the organization, but to also to future-proof themselves, their people, and their business. Well, how do they do that when we don't know what the future looks like? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And if we want the outputs to be different, and by different, I mean, you know, better, perhaps, Bearing in mind, of course, that our biggest client is probably somebody else's biggest prospect. We've got to bear in mind that uh, customer needs and uh, demands are constantly changing. And so and we have to look to our leaders to be able to lead us through uh, these difficult times. So it was Marshall Goldsmith that first coined the phrase, what got you here, or necessarily got you there. And then the other, uh, Wayne Gretzky, if you know the the, uh, the, the ice hockey player of fame, he says that his job was always to skate to where the puck will be as opposed to skate where the puck is or has been. Mm. So, so how do we do that? Well, the thing about most leaders is that they feel, they believe that wisdom comes as a consequence of time served. In other words, if I've been doing this job for 10 years, and then I've been doing this job for 12 years. By dint of the extra two years experience, I will be 20% better. But that's not the case. I mean, we interview uh, CEOs and uh, uh, executives for a lot of our clients. And when we interview them about their experiences and they say, well, they've had 20 years leadership experience, what they really did was they learned like bonkers for two years and then they just did rinse and repeat five times. So what we did, we uh, when we wrote this, which is our third book of my third book, um, we interviewed 
um, we got our arms around as many of the most forward-looking, developmental, uh, kind of solutions-oriented leaders that we could find in lots of different industries, lots of different verticals, lots of different market sizes to look for what are the common traits, capabilities, competencies of the best leaders. What they all had in spades, and we talk, a, we give lots of examples in the books, um, and, and what a lot of businesses are looking for now in leaders is, is, is a skill of insight. Insight. Now, where does insight come from? It, again, it doesn't come just from it doesn't just come from time served. It comes from being very intentional about how we're thinking about ourselves and our own skills and our development and, and our people. So let me give you an example. Um, I did a talk um, just before COVID, actually, to about 800 leaders in the room. And I asked, I asked them all, uh, by a show of hands, who here in the audience believes that they have no leadership blind spots. Okay. So who believes they have no leadership blind spots? And thankfully, because that would have been a rather awkward conversation, maybe maybe the talk a lot longer than necessarily was intended to, nobody put their hands in the air, which is good. In other words, they all recognized that they must have some blind spots, some pinch points, some speed bumps, right? Because because nobody's perfect, right? You're not, I'm not, none of your leaders are. So that's great. So they all recognize they have some blind spots. And then when I said, okay, terrific, 800 people recognize that they have some blind spots. And then when we say, okay, well then, can you just take a minute and write down what they are? Well, that's a trickier question because if they knew what they were, right, then they wouldn't be a blind spot. So it, it's slightly circular and oblique question. But the point that the, the fact of the matter is that I have, as a leader of my organization, I have some blind spots. So do you, and so do all of your listeners and, and, and uh, your audience. They all have some blind spots. Well, what are they? Well, they don't know. So how do we develop that? Well, we have to grow self-awareness. Every kind of leadership thought, any thought leader on leadership at the moment, every, all of the research points to the fact that EQ, in terms of emotional intelligence, is significantly more important than IQ, which is kind of like, you know, smarts. And, you know, it's like university smarts or whatever, even from the University of Life. So EQ outperforms IQ by a factor of about three to one. Coca-Cola first discovered this when they looked at all of their divisions and said, which of our divisions are doing the best? And then they measured against EQ and IQ and we would tend to think that it was the smartest ones, the ones who got all of the degrees, the ones that got the, you know, the MBAs and the doctorates and the fellowships, that they would be the best leaders. Not at all. It had zero to do with IQ and everything to do with EQ. And EQ relies on more than anything else, self-awareness. So the question then is, how do we develop self-awareness so that we can then figure out where our blind spots are, figure out, therefore, what are the things that we need to improve to increase insight to figure out, therefore, where do we need to move the business going forwards? I want to make it as practical as possible. So yeah. give us some of the, to. yeah. So I give us to. on the blind spots. Like if you said like, okay, here's the top three blind spots that I've seen out of a lot of leaders. Give me some practical examples of what those are. Um, I'll give you the top five. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Love See, it. In no particular order of priority. And, and we, have a, we have an assessment that we have developed with probably the largest uh, leadership assessment company in the world. Um, so for any of them, any of your people that are listening and thinking, well, I wonder what, I wonder what mine are, then just jump on to uh, mydailyleadership.com and look up, there is a tab somewhere that says leadership assessment, right? To, 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 to dive on there. Okay. So in no particular order, and I can just give you the list and then I'll explain them if you like, if that would make sense. So the first leadership blind spot is uh, related to the development of people. So that's people development. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, um, most leaders are pretty good at saying, hey, listen, all of my people have to be on some kind of personal development review and uh, learning path. And we go, great, terrific. So what are they learning? And they tend to put them into programs that are specifically related to their job, as opposed to how do we really understand the motivation of our people? How do we make not just cooperative, but collaborative teams? How do we really get good at masterful mentorship and how do we help people reach their full potential? So the first blind spot is around people development. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Next thing is company development. Well, that sounds very counterintuitive because leaders know that they have to develop the company. And, and in the main, they're pretty good at developing company vision, mission, all of those kind of stuff. And they're maybe even pretty good at short, medium, and long-term planning. But what they're really bad at um, is improving company processes more than anything else. And, and companies rely on... Do you, do you have a, you have children, Chantel? Yes, I have okay. two. I have one that's now out of the house, and then I have one that is 11 years old. Okay, splendid. Well, do you remember when they were like two and three and your yeah. folks probably said to you, you need a system. You've got to get them into a routine. You've got to make sure that, right, that everything is... Well, companies are the same. And most leaders don't... They try and... What, what they try and do is they try and delegate results. So in other words, I need this, I need this, I need this. Sorry, they try and delegate actions do this and do this and do this and each do this and each do that. What they don't do is delegate results or they delegate actions and not results. And that's a real big blind spot for most leaders. Mm. Number three is self-development. You know, when you we, when we interview lots of leaders and we say, okay, show me what, you know, the development files for all of your people and, you know, the, the, the good leaders make sure that all of those things are in place and there's a good learning development path for all their people. We say, okay, terrific. Show me yours. And then they kind of get a little bit squirrely and they say, well, you know, I read the FT or, you know, um, I watch videos and <laughs> I'm part of this group. But it's very unstructured and un uh, disorganized, right? So that self-development piece for leaders is how are you very intentionally developing you and again, they're terrible at that. Uh, strategy development is number four, but mainly that's around solving problems with tools and mental models. Now, we only know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. So if I were to say to you, for example, um, uh, how, how are you solving this problem? Most of them kind of use brute force to you know, go through a whole, and, and they kind of rely on out of their personality to say, well, I tell my guys that this needs to be fixed and they need to get on with it and they need to fix this problem. But what they don't actually do is use um, tools. They're not really good at, at, at using tools. So when we actually ask them, well, how do you evaluate? How do you evaluate that, it, you know, what the importance of the problem is, what the solutions look like? They have no clue when you actually dig into it. So that's a problem. So that's strategy development. And then leadership development, that's developing other leaders. Um, they're pretty dreadful at developing um, other leaders, mainly due to, are you a big fan of Brene Brown? I imagine you are. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I don't know a ton of her stuff, but what well, I've seen of it, I do like. Yeah. So she kind of talks about dare to lead and it's all about courage and it's about um, you know, it's about saying, you know, hey, I don't know how to do this and can somebody help me? Most leaders, that's a big blind spot for leaders. They they feel unable to say, I don't know, right? And they don't kind of have that professional humility to say, I don't know, and I need help and and can you help? Because they feel that, well, they've got the big car and the big salary and the car spark, car park space closer to the front door, and they should know all things but the best ones don't. So, so those are the kind of the biggest five um, uh, blind spots, but there are millions of them. But anyway, here's the point. So how do we fix all of these things, right? How do we, how do we recognize that we're not the finished article? That's important. How do we build our 
self-awareness. That's important. How do we develop people in the company and ourselves and strategy and leaders? You know, how do we, how do we grow leaders? Well, it comes back to this principle, Chantel, that, um, wisdom comes from evaluated experience. I, here's an exercise that all of your people can do. It's a super quick exercise. And if I were to ask you, uh, I was asked once by CEO, I, I got a job, sorry, I was the CEO, <laughs> he was the chairman. So I was the CEO of what you might call a Fortune 60 company, which is a huge company with thousands of people and billions in revenue. And I just got the new job and the chairman called me into his office. And um, he said, hey, Antonio, do me a favor. Have you ever worked for a dreadful boss? Right. And so I'm imagining, have you ever worked for a dreadful boss, Chantal? I haven't. I actually I have not. Good. I've had a really great people okay. I've worked for. But I also think, I also think I've always been a great employee. So okay. when people say, oh, I worked for a dreadful boss, I feel like, what were you like as an employee, right? Nice. Like I've nice. literally never, ever worked nice. for anybody that I wasn't like, this person was amazing. I, I literally can't even think of one, yeah. but I also was very respectful. I always did what I was supposed to do. And, you know, I was a great employee as well. So I think that well, has I, a lot to do with it. I mean, well, the news, there will be people listening to this right now spitting their soup out at the uh at the at their iphones um you're very fortunate most people have at some point in their lives worked for a fairly dreadful individual and um you know not everybody of course but even if you haven't ever worked for a terrible boss um it's easy to imagine what that list of dreadfulness might look like and my chairman said to me write down a list of what does terrible what a terrible boss might look like and the, the list is fairly obvious. It's a micromanager, a bully, someone that's inconsistent, somebody that plays favorites. You know, you can, you can imagine what that list might look like. So I wrote down five or six things and he said, terrific, write down some more. Then I wrote down some more. And they said, terrific, write down some more. So then I wrote down some more. So all of your listeners, readers, audience can write down that list of, you know, what does dreadfulness look like in terms of a leader? He then said to me, hey, will you do me a favor whilst I have you the CEO around here? This was on my second day on the job, right? I said, yeah, what, what, what can I do? How can I, how can I help you? He said, could you promise me that whilst ever you're here, you never do any of the things that's on that list, right? And so, and I thought, crikey, what a great, what a great introduction to, by kind of looking at what does terrible look like, it helps you kind of start to think about what does great look like, right? So. He said, keep that list with you at all times. Have you ever seen the corridor? I might ask you for it. And But six months later, we're in a board meeting and he asked all of the directors, there were 13 directors around the table and he asked all of them to get their own list out. We all had our own list. I mean, it was very, very personal way of kind of keeping us all on the straight and narrow, which was terrific. So, so write down what does dreadful look like in terms of leadership and that helps you then work towards well what does terrific look like in terms of leadership and how do i constantly strive to get there because none of us are perfect right i'm not and you're not and none of your audience are either so let's come back to this evaluated experience piece where at the end of every day every day because the best in the world you know those people that say they are trying to improve um and if you then said to them, okay, so do you journal? And they said that they don't journal, then don't believe them, right? Because we've all got so much work to do. But one of the things that you put in your journal at the end of every day is to say, okay, what would my leadership report card look like today? Would I give myself an A plus for everything I did today? Or were there probably some gaps? What, could, I have, could I have spoken to somebody better? Could I, what should I have done or could I have done or what should I fail to have done or what did I fail to do that I should have done? Where could I have improved? Where could, if I give myself an A minus for, you know, leading that meeting, what would be the ways that I could make that uh, better? So that's what evaluated experience looks like, right? And that's where wisdom comes from evaluated experience, constantly trying to get better. Whoever you can think of, Chantel, that's successful in any, in, in any area whether it's sports or entertainment or 
the, the best in the world, all of them journal. And now a word from our sponsor, Canzel Realty. Run your business your way, only at Canzel Realty. You can have all the freedom with none of the standard real estate red tape. If you're an agent, you get to run the show however you want and be your own boss. If you want to launch a team, you don't have to jump through all the hurdles and holdups. From day one, you'll have tons of tools and perks to offer your team. Powerful real estate tech like KV Core, Brokerman, and Skyslope. If you want to be your own brokerage or already have your own brokerage, that's not a problem either. You'll still get to run it however you want. All Canzel requires is a small Powered by Canzel logo next to yours. You can be the broker, you can be the manager, and you get to determine splits. You get all the tech, admin support, ownership stock, and revenue share, but most importantly, all the freedom, all the time, only at Canzel Realty. Quick story. Another CEO of mine, this, this sounds terrible, but another CEO of mine, when I first joined the organization, sorry, another chairman of mine, when I first joined an organization, called me into his, his office and said, hey, Antonio, do you journal? Um, and I said, no, because I did. So he said, oh, why? And I said, probably because I'm not a 16-year-old Victorian schoolgirl, Dave. So he said, well, okay, I know that 16-year-old Victorian schoolgirls journal, dear diary, Mr. Darcy was mean to me today, but um, go and find the most successful people that you can, the most successful leaders, the most successful, anybody that you know, find eight of them and see whether or not they journal. And by the time I got to five, right, if you just Google you know, the benefits of journaling, there's 150 million articles. And when you, you know, which famous people journal, successful people journal, the list is, is, is enormous. And then when I speak to leaders and I ask them whether or not they journal, whether they do a bit of self-analysis, whether they figure out how to improve, whether they spend time figuring out, get organizing their thoughts, getting all of that stuff in order, you know, white space, actually put in their calendar, white space to think about stuff, strategy and direction and so on. The most successful ones do. And whether that's a tennis player who, you know, we coach, uh, you know, Olympic athletes and so on, all of these people journal. And it's something that hasn't yet properly seeped into leadership, which is why we wrote the book. And uh, yesterday I discovered that it was on the list of the top 15 leadership books of last year, um, which was very nice. So it seems to have struck a chord with people where, and when we say to people, why don't you journal? They go, well, I would if I knew what to write. And I would if I knew how long I would have to write and how often to write. And we answer all of that stuff in the book, which is kind well, of- let me, let me give you something. I have a love-hate relationship with journaling. Yeah, okay. I me. don't enjoy doing it because I don't like writing. I actually have my degree in math because I hate okay. reading and I hate writing. So I listen to every book on audio mm -hmm. and I, I'm happy to talk, but I don't love to write. And so what I did now is I really believe in the idea of journaling. So now what I did was I on a Zoom call, you can actually tie your Zoom to something called rev.com. So what you do is you just get on Zoom, you hit record, it automatically syncs to my rev. So anytime I record anything, it just puts it on. So I can just go on and talk about my day. And then I have my assistant kind of take it from there and put it into a journal. And then I can use it for any books that I want to write or anything that I want. But then I have worked with what I know I'm not good at. Like I'm not good at reading. I'm not good at writing. I have my degree in mathematics because of that reason, but that doesn't mean I'm not a great leader. It just means that this is where I have to pivot and go, okay, well, I'm not great at writing, so it gets on my nerves. I can sit and talk for 10 minutes on this thing, and it's now transcribed for me. I can keep it all into a like a Word document journal yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and do it that way. So. I just want to throw that out there that if anyone is like me, who's a math major, who's a numbers girl, who doesn't necessarily love to read and write, this whole idea of journaling isn't out for you because I try, 
what I did was I did the journal and then I stopped and then I did it and then I stopped and I thought we've got to come up with a way that I can make it work for myself and it still be effective. So I'm going to pressure test that if you don't. Okay. Mind. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> so we talk about this a lot in the book because a lot of our clients say, well, I'll type it or like you where they speak it and, and, it, and I have a, a uh, a, a Mac book, you probably do too, and you can just transcribe it. It just just throws out, you know, word for word, everything you've written on a huge kind of Word document and so on. But we talk about there was a lot of research done on this issue, particularly the University of California. And the two researchers' names escaped me for the moment. But anyway, we would rather that you wrote just for three to five minutes in the morning and three to five minutes in the afternoon, rather than spend an hour dictating or why, or even 15 minutes, right? Why? Because when you, when you have to write it, I know with a pen on paper, and listen, I know we've got, so we've got AI and we've got type with this, all of that stuff. You have to self-edit very, very carefully because especially our favorite journalists are people who are lazy and don't want to write much. They are our favorite because they get, in fact, it was Steve Jobs that says, I would rather employ a lazy person to do a, a job because they'll figure out the, the, the most efficient way of doing it, right? So which is a bit counterintuitive. But anyway, so when you have to think, so when we present with you a question, so we'll ask you a question, for example, um, We'll say, just as a dumb example, um, we'll give you a scenario and would say, how could we apply courage to this issue? And then we'd like to think about it and we'll say, just in 30 to 40 words, how might a leader apply courage to this issue? What we then have to do is we have to think about it. And then our subconscious and our conscious says, okay, let's say we want to write the cat sat on the mat, right? Just as a dumb example, right? So we then have to kind of process, filter, and then think, we're going to write the cat sat on the mat. We then have to send the instructions to our hand to write the cat sat on the mat. And as we're writing it, so we've edited it, and as we're writing it, we're reading it to make sure that those are the words that we wanted to write. And then we are reinforcing it with ourselves so the cat sat on the mat. What then happens is when we're asleep, we start making all of these connections on a much stronger level. So we would rather you wrote, 40 to 50 words in the morning and 40 to 50 words in the evening, rather than spend 20 minutes um, kind of typing or dictating something and then go, it going into a Word document and get lost in, you know, like the end scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is like a million, million other, you know, uh, uh, places to hide something. So we would rather you just, and in, in our journal that we talk about, you know, we tell people specifically what to journal and what, what to say and what not to say and things to think about. We, we give all of that in the book and we would rather you just wrote 30 or 40 words on this topic in the morning, 30 or 40 words on this topic in the evening. You can do more, but that's just as an absolute minimum. We try and make it a very light lift for people that hate writing because that, and who are short on time because that's most leaders as well. I love that. That's so good. Let's talk about, I, I really loved what you said about the, you know, skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. You know, I yeah. think CEOs and business consultants and other visionaries, um, you know, they've talked about the importance of looking towards the future at all times. And, you know, when you focus on the present or the, fa the past where the puck has been, you're sure to fall behind. And um, I think there's a balance with it, you know, and I just want to talk about practically how do you put that statement into place where you're you're looking towards the future, you're looking for your vision, but also I agree, you've got to focus on the future, but I, I don't know that it needs to be 100% of the time, uh, but I think it, l let's put that into practical yeah. terms so someone yeah. can really put their arms around it. So, so we have a model that we developed for the, uh, for the book as well, which is kind of what a lot of leaders do is they get stuck in the weeds. They get stuck in the day-to-day -day 
you know, what needs fixing? What do we need? What are we looking at? And it's kind of very immediate, very short term thinking. And we, it, it, there was a model, and I can't remember who did it. It was a Boston consulting group, I think. We said, which quadrant are you spending your time in? Is it the high importance, high urgency? And if you're constantly in the high importance, high urgency bracket, then firefighting all day, every day, then there is no time to think about the future. So we developed this model, which is about how much time are you spending task focused and versus how much time are you spending people focused? How much time are you spending being reactive? And how much time are you spending being proactive? And, and in an ideal world, we want our leaders to spend 70% people focused and proactive. And we kind of, the way that we constructed the model is move up to the right, up to the right, up to the right. So review your day and review your time and all of that kind of stuff. So here's the thing. Um, when we think about how do we skate to where the is going to be, what a lot of leaders do for fear of making a mistake, for fear of make they kind of get into analysis paralysis and for fear of making the wrong decision, they don't do anything. But we've all been on an airplane, right? And so when I was learning to fly a million years ago, you know, you would take off from an airport. And if you wanted to go from JFK to London Heathrow, for example, you would, you know, exit the airport airspace at JFK. I was on a plane last week from JFK to uh, Paris, actually, where I'm living. And um, you would go to a particular bearing. This is where, you know, Paris, you know, Charles de Gaulle is. But you constantly have to course correct, do you not? You can't just point towards Paris and then land eight and a half hours later and think you're going to land at the airport because that's impossible. So this principle of take imperfect action, make sure that you have defined what the earliest milestones of success look like. Make sure that you know how you're measuring it. Make sure you know what your KPIs are. Make sure that you've communicated it very clearly to everybody and then constantly review and course correct, review and course correct, review and course correct. And taking imperfect action is so much better than waiting until you have the perfect plan, the perfect scenario, the perfect organization, because by the time you execute that, the world has moved on. And so it's about making sure that you've got the core values right. Everybody kind of knows what it is, how to behave. We know where the goal is, and we're constantly measuring and course correct, measure course correct, measure course correct. And by the time the future is here, we will be where the puck is going to be. That makes sense. Mm, I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Tell me. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Okay. So uh, the easiest thing to do is either jump on Amazon and look for My Daily Leadership, right? Um, other booksellers are available. Uh, and then they can get the book uh, on audio, uh, paper, electronic. If you do get the audio on, I've, I've uh, um, uh, narrated it. So if you want to hear more of my dumb accent, you can certainly do that. Um, or you can jump on our website, which is www.mydailyleadership, mydailyleadership.com. And there's a ton of kind of um, uh, tools and white papers and journals that you can download and lots of help and assets. So it's, if you want to email me, it's antonio at mydailyleadership.com. And I promise whoever it is, whatever it is within, 24, 36 hours, me or somebody, but I promise get back to you with an answer. So um, that's, that's how to get hold of me. I love it. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 